to survive without brain injury. At normothermia, irreversible brain damage occurs after four minutes of arrest. And so we use cooling to try and increase the ischemic tolerance of the brain. But other changes occur as well. The hemoglobin avidity for oxygen uh, and the solubility of oxygen both increase uh, during cooling. Uh, there's a marked reduction in the cerebral metabolic rate. The Q10, this quotient of metabolic rate for every 10 degrees of, of temperature difference, uh, changes. Uh, and the use of cooling potentially increases the safe arrest period. If we just look at the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve for a moment, as temperature reduces, the alkalinity of blood increases. This means the dissociation curve goes to the left and this will jeopardize uh, tissue oxygenation. And it's for this reason that pH stat management has been considered in some cases although it's not commonly used. We've been doing some some studies in which we've been instrumenting patients with uh, jugular bulb catheters, a left common carotid um, uh, flow probe and various monitoring devices. And this is the, uh, some cumulative data uh, from this project. We can see that in patients of about 70 kilograms, they start at the 35 degrees centigrade with left common carotid blood flow of roughly 250 mils per minute. By 25 degrees centigrade, this blood flow has halved and then below that temperature, the flow rate plateaus. When we calculate left common carotid artery territory oxygen consumption with cooling, we can see that that also decreases quite absolutely. And the uh, time at which water regulation is lost, which is somewhere between 25 and 20 degrees centigrade, there is also a plateauing in this exponential curve of uh, metabolic rate reduction. We observe also changes in oxygen extraction. If you look at the red bars here, they are the total oxygen extraction occurring at the different temperatures. And these are all patients having standard flow rate conditions. And we see that the component of oxygen extraction, uh, of dissolved oxygen extraction, increases as temperature falls. If we look at how patients behave, if we take their 35 degrees centigrade uh, metabolic rate as 100%, we can see that by 25 degrees centigrade, the actual metabolic rate has fallen to about 45%. And at 15 degrees centigrade, it's fallen slightly below 20%. And this allows us to calculate, in humans, the adult uh, Q10, which for our data, shows a Q10 of 2.6 between 30 and 25, and a Q10 of 2.3 between 25 and 15. These changes in metabolic rate are associated with marked uh, elevation of the jugular bulb oxygen saturation. But this elevation is not accompanied by such a profound elevation in the uh, regional SO2 signal, which is a mixed signal between the arterial and the venous phases within the brain. What we observed is that uh, the starting left RSO2 signal is about 57 at 35 degrees centigrade, rising to about 72 with cooling. And if you compare that with the fall of the percentage metabolic rate, you can see that although it's a guide, it's not necessarily an assured guide of what is happening. By taking the uh, safe arrest duration is four minutes at 35 degrees centigrade. We can calculate what each temperature component adds to the safe duration of HCA. And so we can see that at 30 degrees centigrade, the safe duration of HCA is only about eight minutes. But at 15 degrees centigrade, the safe duration has risen to 25 minutes. So each degree of temperature fall is giving additive ischemic tolerance and, and safety, if you like, uh, for circulatory arrest. And these data are directly comparable to those achieved by uh, Griep's group and reported a decade ago. Well, we know now that HCA alone 
is not compatible with good results for the majority of patients. There's an important stroke risk, a very important transient neurological deficit risk, and a neuropsychometric deficit occurs in most patients. The incidence of transient deficit increases after this 25-minute period of deep hypothermia, and the incidence of stroke and mortality increase after 40 and 60 minutes, respectively. There are still protagonists of HCA alone. This is some data from the, uh, from the Yale group in which they had quite credible results for ascending an aortic surgery, but only a, short, a, a few patients uh, in this series underwent total arch replacement, and still prolonged HCA times were predictors of stroke. If we go back 15 years ago, we can see that the duration of circulatory arrest increases the risk of transient neurological deficit profoundly, and this is corroborated by others, and that the, an increase in hypothermic circulatory arrest period beyond 25 minutes reduces the chance that the patient will leave hospital uh, in an anticipated time period. Moreover, when we look at more subtle deficits, um, of, of brain injury and cognitive performance, any inability to, to be tested early after surgery is a significant predictor of poor performance late after the surgery, approximately a year after the surgery. Hypothermic circulatory arrest of more than 25 minutes, very significant predictor for late memory and fine motor loss, and also a determinant of prolonged hospital stay. Just briefly on retrograde cerebral perfusion, we know now that it cannot be used without deep hypothermia, that generally it fails to provide metabolic support, and it fails to improve neuropsychometric outcome. There is a possible effect on mortality, uh, and perhaps some effect on stroke in some series, but it has little effect on transient neurological deficit. The one large center continuing to use retrograde cerebral perfusion is the uh, Houston group of SAFI, who have demonstrated that the use of RCP had a significant reduction in their uh, mortality risk and their stroke risk, but no effect on their transient neurological deficit risk. The same group have reported very recently where they've used, compared either retrograde cerebral perfusion or a combinated integrated technique of initial retrograde perfusion with uh, thereafter anti-grade perfusion, uh, but have seen a higher mortality paradoxically in the anti-grade group. Nevertheless, selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion has become the mainstay of, of, of cerebral protection. And in many, many series, elective mortalities for arch replacement are now um, less than 8%, stroke rates are low, one-year survival rates are high, and most centers are undertaking SECP techniques which give a very short cerebral ischemic time of three to six minutes. And we've shown before that the, uh, the use of selective uh, anti-grade perfusion uh, abrogates the oxygen extraction deficit that occurs with HCA. But in the studies of SACP, there are marked inconsistencies in technique for which vessels are cannulated, one, two, or three, the temperature of arrest, the temp the, of corporeal arrest, the temperature of perfusate, the flow rate, and the pressure management and randomized trials are almost non-existent. <coughs> the GREEP technique uh, has changed over the years, all to try and reduce the stroke rate associated with arch replacement. And they've moved from techniques in which were dominantly uh, using HCA to where they then grafted the head and neck vessels to shorten that period and a further triple branch technique to reduce it further but they're all dependent on quite a long period of initial hypothermic circulatory rest, even at 30 minutes in the initial series. And this is why this group has, re has remained an, a, a protagonist of deep hypothermia. But even this delayed commencement of SACP uh, has an adverse effect on brain function. This is, this is the, um, the lower line is the um, uh, behavioral scores of, uh, uh, in a porcine model uh, for deep hypothermic circulatory arrest alone. It's a little bit better, but uh, still impoverished when there is this uh, hypothermic circulatory arrest period followed by SECP with the best outcomes 
with SACP with a very short arrest duration just to insert the cannulae. And by commencing SACP rapidly and to continue it until all anastomoses are complete, HCA times are now reduced to less than five minutes in the majority. But there are some clinical differences with different SACP, SACP temperatures. Two years ago, Minatoya et al. published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, comparative groups, albeit by different eras, when they instituted SACP at 20, 25, and 28 degrees centigrade. The important difference is that to 28 degrees centigrade, <coughs> they used a higher perfusion flow rate and added in left subclavian artery perfusion. The 20 degree centigrade group was somewhat disadvantaged as they had longer SACP and corporeal arrest periods, but the mortalities were not different. Interestingly, when SACP duration and HCA duration were increased, there was a higher initial lactate when the patients arrived on the ITU and a higher consumption of uh, um, transfused platelets. Other groups have also compared um, higher and lower uh, corporeal arrest temperatures. This is some data from Hanover uh, in which they studied C-reactive protein as an index of the inflammatory response generated by the hypothermic circulatory arrest period. You can see that there's no differences in any of the groups at any time point. The, the Bologna group have also considered <coughs> corporeal arrest temperatures between 20, below 25 and greater than 25. They have seen similar mortality between the groups, a uh, not different uh, permanent neurological deficit rate, a slightly higher, but not statistically so, transient neurological deficit rate in the higher temperature group, similar pulmonary complications, similar renal failure, and similar bleeding. When we go back to the Hanover data, there is a concern between the deep hypothermia and the moderate hypothermia groups. There are two striking differences. One is the rate of reoperation for bleeding for with deep hypothermia. Sorry, how can I go back? Previous. Uh, with deep hypothermia. But the other significant effect was that with warmer temperature, the paraplegia rate appeared to increase. This, to an extent, is corroborated from uh, some data from our cells, which, although we've seen no differences in in, in, in stroke mortality or other parameters, we have seen a difference in the change of uh, serum creatinine between days one and seven between warmer and colder patients. Experimentally, the perfusate temperature of the SACP may also be important. Be this is behavioral score data again from a poor sign model from uh, Dr. Griep's group, which showed that lower SACP temperature at 10 degrees centigrade was associated with better behavioral scores in this study group. They wondered whether this was related to less lower cerebral blood flow and less emboli, although the Hanover group have shown clinically that the SACP is associated with a very small number of, of cerebral emboli, whether it was related to cerebral, reduced cerebral oxygen consumption um, uh, during the arrest period and le less met metabolic demand and less uh, potential for ischemic injury and a lower cerebral blood flow rebound that can occur after the uh, restitution of corporeal flow. Further data in a stimulant mo model uh, has looked at the two SACP temperatures with the constant perfusion pressure now at 30 and 25 degrees centigrade. We can see that at cooling there is this profound fall in total cerebral blood flow and then we increase it with our 10 mil per kilogram um, flow rates for SACP. We see that the vascular resistance rises during cooling but falls during the SAC period and that the cerebral metabolic rate again is much lower in the hatch bars with the uh, lower temperature SACP group. And this lower blood flow, which has potentially protective effects, is seen in all the different areas of the brain. Clinically, warmer SACP shortens operative times. This is data uh, from Salazar, published last year, 
where they compared 18 degrees centigrade SACP with 25 degrees centigrade SACP, and, and in the um, 18 degree, sorry, the 25 degree temperature uh, group, they saw shorter cooling and rewarming periods, as you'd expect, but higher serum lactate generation, potentially an adverse clinical effect. When the uh, group of Johnson et uh, al. looked at microdialysis in a, in a uh, experimental model, they saw higher brain tissue lactate generation with higher SACP temperatures. In a porcine model looking at the, the visceral effects, that higher temperatures had a higher post-circulatory arrest lactate burden, worse intestinal uh, perfusion, and more intestinal edema. Another reason why higher temperatures may be disadvantageous is their apparent effect on intracranial pressure. You can see here, comparing three temperatures of SACP, 10, 20, and 30 degrees centigrade, that the 30 degrees centigrade group each have a much more profound increase in intracerebral pressure, which may be profoundly important in the gener generation of transient neurological deficit. This increase in intracranial pressure persisted for uh, four hours following the surgery. They also saw this fall in sagittal sinus oxygen saturation uh, comp uh, comparing uh, 20 degree, 10 degree, and uh, 30 degree SACP, which again may be disadvantageous. So there is this debate that's ongoing regarding SACP and the corporeal address temperature and the temperature of the perfusate, which is yet to be resolved. Experimental data tends to favor a lower temperature outcome. But our results for art surgery are not perfect. There is still a similar neuropsychometric deficit in patients 12 weeks after surgery, which does not appear to be abrogated by the use of SACP. Moreover, data again from the uh, Bologna group investigating PET scanning and MRI scanning in patients undergoing SACP has shown quite a disturbing incidence of occipital lobe hypoperfusion or hypometabolism following bilateral carotid SACP, perhaps indicative that uh, we are not perfusing the posture of the brain effectively. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the usage of SACP has allowed corporeal arrest temperatures to rise above previously used profound hypothermic values. Clinical studies show little overall outcome differences with arrest temperatures above or below 25 degrees centigrade. But experimental studies continue to suggest that colder SACP perfusate temperatures are superior. Clinical and experimental studies in prolonged corporeal arrest periods suggest concern with warmer temperatures, including spinal cord protection, uh, which I'm sure we'll hear more about later. But even with SACP, brain protection remains inadequate. This may relate to intracranial pressure changes, the number of vessels perfused, and the temperature effect may uh, be having less importance now uh, when we consider SACP alone. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Munzer. Great overview, and uh, still many questions, I think, yeah. open questions, and the interesting thing is everybody's doing it different. It's our impression, too. I have one question for you. What about your cerebral monitoring? How do you guide your, your pump technician? Um, what do you use? Use infrared spectroscopy or whatever? Okay. Um, the data that uh, I presented is some data from patients in a, a randomized trial, so they have very strict uh, monitoring, and they're all handled in a very similar way, apart from the, um, the interventional variable. In patients outside of those studies, uh, we have um, a cooling temperature 22 with an SACP temperature of 22, so similar perfusate and corporeal arrest temperatures uh, that we do strive for a 10 mil per kilogram flow rate, but we do nothing to adjust the pressure, so we don't increase flow rate to increase the pressure. We just accept the pressure delivered by a 10 mil per kilogram flow. Okay, questions from the floor? For time reasons, maybe one or two, maybe. Sir, please. Can you can you come to the to the mic, please?
It was a very nice review indeed. But uh, I have some questions for you, but they are questions that they arrive from clinical practice. Number one, what is the magic number of 10 ml per kilo? I mean, how we derived on that? Number two is, if we have a patient cool down to 20 or 18 degrees, that 10 ml per kilogram, maybe it's too much for a brain that's already cold. And the question is, does more means better? I mean, if we perfuse a cold brain with 10 ml per kilogram, we maybe increase the intracranial pressure by just perfusion, cold perfusion. So I'm ambivalent about everything. If I perfuse a small guy with 10 ml per kilogram that he's cold at 18, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna blow his brain off. Okay, the, the 10 ml per kilogram uh, originates from the normothermic brain blood flow. And Kazui took 10 mL per kilogram as his starting point for his SACP at a lower temperature. We see from the studies that the actual brain blood flow, as you, let's say you've cooled the patient to 20, is substantially less than 10 mL per kilogram. But nevertheless, we use this tool. And I would agree with you that we don't know enough about the flow rate versus the pressure versus the oxygen delivery in SACP to give a, a definite answer to your question. There's no doubt, experimentally, and I didn't go into that, that, that higher pressures experimentally in SACP are deleterious to the brain. Uh, and and uh, this, this is why we do not strive to manipulate pressure uh, during, during our clinical practice. I think your question about a small patient versus a large patient is perhaps a little erroneous because it is a weight indexed uh, flow rate and so they are both according to their body weight getting a similar index but I, I would agree with you that there is this uh, um, ambiguity about what we do we, we, we suddenly go for, to a, a cold patient who would have a lower uh, index cerebral blood flow at that temperature and then we go back to a normothermic SAC uh, uh, rate for the SACP blood flow. The data, the data of experimental data of looking at lower flow rates shows probably acceptable uh, brain oxygenation if you even halve that flow rate. But what you can't do then is maintain the pressure and then you have all the uncertainties of loss of cerebral autoregulation and uh, uh, pressure-related flow rates in different parts of the brain. That's the concern. Short question, short answer, please. Hi, Jahang Rappu from uh, Calgary, Canada. Uh, do you think there's a role for cerebral oximetry during the circle rest, and especially if, if the cerebral oximetry is no longer symmetric? Uh, definitely. I'd like to leave that question because I'm sure it'll be addressed very fully by uh, Professor Thelin. But yes, we continue to monitor that uh, regional RSA2, both, uh, both sides of the brain, all cases. And discrepancy, discrepancy more than absolute value is, is, the, is the core guide. Okay, thank you very much. So we move on exactly with what we are dis we're discussing right now. The near infrared spectroscopy in neuromonitoring is presented by Professor Tillin from Uppsala. Chairman and delegates, uh, first I would like to thank the uh, association for the invitation <coughs> to give this lecture, lecture on the utility of near-infrared spectroscopy in NERS. I have no disclosures and my research work in this field has been founded by grants from the Swedish Heartlung Foundation. In this lecture, <coughs> I will briefly give you the historical and physical background to NIRS. I will give you an overview over its use in cardiovascular surgery today. And finally, I will uh, speculate about its use in the treatment of thoracoabdominal surgery aneurysms. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, some of the most important scientific contributions in this field were made in the 18th and 19th centuries. Pierre Boucher was a multidisciplinary French scientist with his main interest in a naval architecture studying problems like the masting of ships and the deviation of the compass at sea. But in 1729, he published Essai d'optique sur la gradation de la lumière, which determines the quantity of light lost by passing through a given extent of the atmosphere. This made him the first known discoverer of what was later named the Beer Lambert Law. Johann Heinrich Lambert was a Swiss mathematician, physicist, and astronomer. And as a mathematician, he worked with, uh, <coughs> he introduced hyperbolic function, functions into trigonometry, and he also worked with properties of projections. Of projections. In 1760, he published a book, Photometria, where he presented the law of light absorption, the Beer Lambert law. And finally, August Beer, and I could not find a photo in the internet, it was a bit surprising. Uh, <clears throat> he was a German physicist and mathematician living about 100 years ago, and he finalized this Beer-Lambert law, which is applied to all light, including the near-infrared light with a wavelength of 700 to 1400 nanometers. The Beer-Lambert law relates the decrement in transmitted uh, light intensity to the absorption properties of the material and the distance the light travels through this material. NIRS <coughs> is a method uh, to measure regional oxygenation saturation, RSO2, of tissue hemoglobin by determining the difference in intensity between the transmitted and received near-infrared light according to the mentioned Beer-Lambert law. Uh, biological material, as the skull, is relatively transparent uh, to near-infrared light. Such light can penetrate into tissue with nearest oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin can be detected. The technique cannot distinguish between arterial and venous components, uh, uh, but usually the assumption is made that 30% of the blood is arterial and 70% is venous. For to compensate for the more superficial tissue as the extracerebral component, two receiving optodes at different dis distances from the transmitting optode are uh, reduced. And by this technique, a reading from tissue 1.5 to 2 centimeters from the surface is possible. In 1977, <coughs> FF Jobs's uh, reported the first experiments on transparency of near-infrared light in cerebral and myocardial uh, tissue. And the first commercial device, INVOS, was introduced to the market more than 20 years ago. Today, FDA has approved both INVOS and uh, re quite recently Foresight for clinical use. INVOS is measuring uh, changes in regional oxygen saturation to detect trends. Foresight is claimed to give absolute values uh, of oxygen saturation and with great accuracy. There is experimental, experimental data that could support this. Besides with these two devices, there are several on the market <coughs> that are intended for investigational use, and there are some differences in their characteristics. There are several confounding factors to consider in the use of NIRS. Extracerebral tissue is estimated to contribute about 15% of their cerebral region oxygen saturation reading, with the remaining 85% coming from the brain. This relation could vary depending <coughs> on thickness of the extracerebral tissue. And other uh, uh, examples of factors are that could uh, confound the readings are hemodilution and temperature. Therefore, it is important to use NIRS as a trend monitor for the individual patient, at least in, in the use of the INVOS device. For this reason, it is also very important to start the registration before the planned procedure. And it has been reported that non-metabolizing tissue in cadavers can show measurable value, values of NIRS, and this 
f further underlines the importance to use NIS with a trend monitoring approach and the results should be interpreted in the given context. In several experimental studies, there is a correlation between uh, uh, brain saturation and O2 saturation in the jugular bulb. However, this is not a constant finding and results from other studies have demonstrated variations in these values and limited correlations. <coughs> Monitoring nearest with, the, with nearest during hypothermic arrest with or without cerebral perfusion is today widely used. During cooling, there is usually an increase in the nearest reading. During arrest, a continuous decrease in regional saturation can be expected. The degree of this decrease is dependent on temperature and length of arrest. And there are no exact recommendations in the literature for cutoff values under these conditions, but the decrease can be quite extensive. A mathematical model to determine the rate of decrease under different conditions have recently been presented by the Mount Sinai Group from New York, and the practical use of this model has to be evaluated. During bilateral <coughs> uh, antigas cerebral perfusion, usually only small changes are registered compared to pre-arrest uh, values. Unilateral changes during bilateral cerebral perfusion could indicate kinking or displacement of a cannula, carotid obstruction caused by progression of a dissection, major embolization, or a technical error in the perfusion line. In some clinics, uh, <coughs> unilateral uh, antigate perfusion is used and uh, the results are reported to be good, but in such a setting, adequate cerebral monitoring becomes even more important and retrograde cerebral perfusion could also be monitored by NILS, but uh, as uh, already said by Professor Bonser, this method has a, a limited metabolic support and uh, the interpretation of the measurement must be done with great care. <coughs> Today there are several studies demonstrating correlation between perioperative uh, brain saturation and postoperative cognitive dysfunction, uh, cerebrovascular accidents, uh, prolonged hospital stay, morbidity, and mortality. Merkin performed a randomized blinded study with 200 patients undergoing coronary surgery. And <coughs> the treatment of uh, decreasing saturation was associated with a shortening of the ICU stay and a significantly reduced incidence of major morbidity and mortality. Deneau and Merkin have presented an algorithm <coughs> in the use of brain oximetry. It proposes a systematic analysis and measures to be taken in the case of declining saturation. It has pr been proven to be effective uh, both during major abdominal and during coronary surgery. The effectiveness of measures taken to correct <coughs> a decrease in uh, saturation was demonstrated in a study by Merkin on patients undergoing coronary surgery. And the most common interventions were to raise the pump flow or uh, the arterial pressure. There are several studies on the use of NIRS <coughs> during carotid and arterectomy. Mill found that a decrease of 12% in NIRS was an indication for the use of a shunt, and other studies have confirmed that cutoff values uh, of decreases between 10 and 20% are <laughs> of importance. NIRS has also been applied to other areas than the brain for measurement of tissue perfusion. Some of these studies uh, were performed in the early postoperative period. And NIRS in the lower extremities could be used for detecting compartment syndrome, to identify malperfusion after dissection, and for monitoring distal perfusion during CPB with femoral artery cannulation. It could also be used during volume resuscitation after trauma and hypovolemic shock. And in children, <coughs> renal uh, saturation with sensors in the flank has been demonstrated to correlate with gastric tonometry, central mixed venous saturation, blood lactate, 
postoperatively after corneal heart surgery. And in an animal study with large pigs, it was shown that NIRS <coughs> could detect spinal ischemia produced by sequential intercostal uh, uh, artery ligation. And there is a case report uh, uh, reporting a, a case uh, where if a correlation was found between NIRS in the lumbar spine area and changes in the CSF drainage in a patient undergoing endovascular treatment of the aorta. It is well known that the surgical treatment for thoracic abdominal aneurysm runs a considerable risk uh, for complication, and spinal complication is one of the most feared. There are several different strategies, as you all know, for the treatment of uh, these aneurysms. The traditional and, I think, more historical method uh, is open surgery with clamping and without any support. Uh, more widely used today, I suppose, open surgery with mild hypothermia and <coughs> left heart bypass is, and uh, the other option is open surgery in deep hypothermia and with circulatory arrest. During the last years, there has been um, a new method introduced, the hybrid intervention with deviation of abdominal vessels and endovascular treatment at one time or sequentially. And all these methods have their advantages and disadvantages, but they all <coughs> have the need for careful monitoring. Nearest monitoring, uh, both preoperatively and postoperatively, could add valuable information in the monitoring used today or during these procedures. Sensors of the forehead, uh, on the forehead and on the lower extremities will give information both on central and peripheral uh, hemodynamics, but has to be analyzed according to the surgical strategy used. And hopefully it will be possible to monitor spinal and splanchnic perfusion in the coming years. There is a technical challenge to measure the relatively low blood flow in the sp spinal cord. Measurements of flow in solid abdominal organs are easier to perform and devices of, for this can be available, available in the near future. This could reduce the risk for complications. To conclude, NOSIS is, is a user-friendly technique for non-invasive and continuous monitoring of perfusion. NIRSC should be used as a trend monitor on an individual basis. NIRS monitoring can be analyzed and measures taken in accordance with an algorithm. NIRS is today important during surgery with hypothermic arrest and cerebral perfusion. NIRS could probably be more widely used during cardiac surgery, and NIRS may have a role during advanced general and vascular surgery. NIRS is important for postoperative monitoring after advanced pediatric surgery. And this will probably be important, an important adjunct in treatment of thoracic abdominal aneurysms. But <coughs> as in all monitoring, the given information has to be interpreted with care and requires good knowledge in the human pathophysiology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Paper is open for discussion. Any questions? Um, you said uh, that uh, we start with the assumption that about 30% of the blood is arterial and 70% is venous. Is there any uh, background for that? Where does this come from, this assessment? Well, that was, uh, it, it comes from the literature. I yeah, cannot I understand. Uh, but yes, but, but I, I, I don't know really how they uh, investigated that. No, I can't say that. Any other comments? Yes, please. Hi, uh, Ed from uh, Leipzig. Um, I'm particularly interested in the uh, spinal cord um, monitoring, and we've tried what you just suggested in the, in the lab, and it's very difficult to get through the bone and the, and the spine. Um, do you have any idea how we could overcome uh, that problem and to actually reach in the right depth um, by that technology? Uh, no, I have no real idea. I, I only know that this is a technical challenge for, uh, and the, it is the limits of this uh, uh, technique for the time being. Uh, if there is uh, 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 any change in the future, in, uh, I don't know, but uh, I have some contacts with the industry and they say that it will take some time to solve this problem. 
So I'm more optimistic about uh, Splanknik uh, uh, registrations. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. We have to move on. I would like to ask Dr. Etz to step forward. He will talk to us about ischemic tolerance of the spinal cord. While he's uh, preparing, I would like to remind the audience that it's strictly prohibited to take photographs and to record the presentations. Yeah, um, uh, Professor Nzigasa, members and guests. Spinal cord injury um, is the most devastating complication after extensive thoracic and thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair, and paraplegia remains still too frequent, occurring up to 20% of extensive open and endovascular repair. Uh, let me just briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm a surgeon at Heart Center Leipzig with Professor Moore right now, and I have spent five years at the Mount Sinai Hospital with Dr. Grieb um, as an aortic fellow in the OR and then in charge of the research laboratory as an assistant professor. Um, let me give you a brief overview of um, what I'm going to be talking about. It's basically three things that we think are important. It's temperature, as Professor Bonser said before, um, and I will probably focus a little bit more on the spinal part of that. Um, it's pressure, and it's the collateral network um, that um, it has probably the most important role for spinal cord viability at each, each stage of any aortic procedure. Um, and this is basically what the collateral network looks like. Um, this is a vascular cast from experimental studies in the laboratory, and you can see the aorta here. And um, Could you stop taking photographs, please, in the middle there? Um, Sorry. So, y thank you. So the, uh, you can see the, and it's basically this picture is being published next month anyway. So, you can see the aorta here, the renals, and the first lumbar. So, renal here, first lumbar here. And um, you can see that these, the segmental arteries give rise to this ex rich collateral network and that the actual portion um, that, that feeds the spinal cord is just about 5% right here in the middle um, of all vessels, as you can clearly see. And these are providing about 15% of flow um, if you look at the collateral network as, uh, as a whole. So what we have to do is increase the blood flow um, to the cord and that means we have to maintain sufficient flow and pressure in the collateral network and reduce the pressure in the spinal canal. Um, since parapeter is still occurring up to 20%, new strategies to increase ischemic tolerance of spinal cord are critical for both surgical and, in particular, future end vascular repair of descending um, thoracic and thoracoabdominal aneurysms. And in particular, endovascularly, because um, the segmental artery of integrity cannot be preserved in those cases. Um, so talking about the first point, temperature, um, this is a paper of Justus Stauch, um, and uh, he published this in 2004, it's an experimental series on um, mild hypothermia um, in a porcine model, and he was basically comparing two groups, um, and here you see the hind limb function of those animals. After 20 minutes of aortic cross clamping, um, it was preserved in both groups at 32 and 37 degrees. And um, after 25 minutes already, the majority of animals in the normal thermic group suffered spinal cord injury. After 30 minutes, all animals in the normal thermic group were paraplegic. And in the hypothermic group, however, the spinal cord initially tolerated 50 minutes, although delayed onset paraplegia occurred after 60 minutes of cross clamping. This translated into the following time temperature graph, graph determining cross clamp durations, safe or unsafe depending on temperature at cross clamp. And this logarithmic plot um, is indicating safe, as you can see in the blue area, and unsafe in the red, um, with a straight line extrapolation. Um, Hiro Kamiya and uh, Christian Heigl from the Hanover Group were first to uh, report on the dangers of prolonged lower body circuitry arrest with only moderate hypothermia. In the subgroup analysis of patients with lower body circuit arrest for more than 60 minutes at core temperatures between 25 and 28 degrees Celsius, immortality was 27%, and the paraplegia rate, as previously cited by Dr. Professor Banzer, is 18%. I think this is a very important study. Um, to find out what the degree 
uh, of prolonged spinal uh, selective, selective cerebral perfusion at 28 Celsius would expose the spinal cord to severe ischemic injury. We went back to the lab and measured the blood flow to the core that we took 20 um, juvenile pigs, um, randomized the, those into two groups at 90 and 120 minutes. And um, this is probably the most important message of that um, study. The regional spinal cord blood flow analysis at baseline prior to initiation of SCP at 28. You see here, this is the, this green line there. Um, then five minutes after the start of um, SCP and at the end of SCP. And the most important thing is you see here, um, there's no flow to the lower thoracic and lumbar cord for the entire time of SCP. So it is important to realize that whatever core temperature you choose for this region of the cord, this will be it for the entire duration of SCP without perfusion. So this was the, this, what I'm going to show you now is the regional ischemic damage caused after lower body circulatory arrest um, and SCP for 90 and 120 minutes at 28 Celsius. The y-axis shows the grade of ischemic damage and a corresponding low power transfer section of the spinal cord in standard uh, staining from group 90 and 120 survivors. And you can see that the cord segments um, from C1 down to T12, T13 in, in the porcine model are not affected and that there is a dramatic ischemic damage at the lower portion of the spinal cord, which is significantly different, although we can already see it in 90 minute pigs, um, even worse in the 120 minute um, group. So in conclusion, these findings emphasize that the duration of upper body perfusion at moderate hypothermia clearly has its safety limits and that after 90 minutes of upper body perfusion at 28 Celsius, um, irre irreversible spinal cord damage may occur. After 120 minutes, the rate of paraplegia may approach 100%. And these observations augment those made in earlier aortic crest clumping experiments, redefining time and temperature guidelines for avoiding spinal cord injury. Um, yeah, the clinical implications, I think, are clear. And now back to the blood supply of the spinal cord. There's basically two different understandings. And there's the classical understanding based on the idea of one single artery supplying blood to the cord. And then there's the modern network concept, which is about to prove much more useful um, to modern aortic surgery. Um, just briefly, uh, after Justus Strauch had uh, demonstrated the importance of the extra segmental vessels for spinal cord blood supply in the chronic porcine model, in 2003, we went again back to the lab to directly measure spinal cord perfusion pressure for the first time. And um, it was again our Porsche model. Um, we took 10 Yorkshire pigs, put an, a catheter into the stump of a uh, lumbar segmental artery and um, one in the aorta directly. And then we measured the uh, intraoperative spinal cord perfusion pressure. And this is what you see here. Um, prior to clamping at baseline, you see 80 millimeter of mercury for SCPP and 98 for MAP, then with serial segmental artery sacrifice, first positility is gone, and then when we come down to uh, T12, SCPP drops further below 50 in mean and L2, down to L2, we have already 40. Finally, after complete sacrifice of all segmental arteries, SCPP has diminished below 30 millimeters of mercury, less than one third of the systemic pressure. And this graph de describes what you've just witnessed during complete craniocaudal segmental artery sacrifice. SCPP drops from baseline pressures of about 70 mercury, millimeters of mercury by 70% down to about 20 millimeters in all animals. Although the, the systemic pressures were perfectly stable in the postoperative and intraoperatively. Um, and this is probably the most interesting part of this, um, this study. Um, SCPP recovers postoperatively, although there is no more segmental arteries. And this is the time course um, from this significant drop down to 20 millimeters of mercury five hours after clamping. It begins to rise within 24 hours, recovers to 60% at 48, and to almost 100% um, five days after segmental artery sacrifice. And this is one of those animals um, that 
is jumping back into its cage without any segmental arteries patent, basically. So, um, in conclusion, uh, complete segmental artery sacrifice resu results in an SCPP drop below 20 millimeters of mercury for about five hours. And however, MEPs are present for at least one hour after clamping in all animals, indicating that there is functional recovery and normal cord function um, at this point, but only 6% of animals actually um, sustain cord function in the further, further post-operative course. Takes the collateral net network to respond um, about 24 hours, and then after that, it goes back to normal within five days. Um, so the clinical implications of this study were that if we could avoid this low, it probably becomes unnecessary to reimplant the segmentals, and this will enable us to do extensive endovascular repair in the future without the risk of paraplegia if we solve this period, this prob problematic time period. Um, after these experimental studies and our clinical experience had suggested that ischemic cord energy was not only independent of segmental artery sacrifice, segmental artery preservation, sorry, but might occur not intraoperatively, but with an overall uh, paraplegia rate below four percent, uh, but sorry, during first few hours postoperatively, um, we basically went back and did a retrospective um, analysis um, on 800 patients that had been operated over a 16 year period of time, um, all with a segmental artery sacrifice, and all of them basically ended up paraplegic. We, what we did is we picked 10 cases that had delayed onset paraplegia, so that these were all cases that had intact MEP and SSCP measurements at the end of the procedure, indicating um, intact cord viability. Then we matched those cases um, with 10 controls, and these are the, this is the extent of uh, segmental artery sacrifice in both groups. You can see there's no significant difference between the two of them. There were no significant differences in all the uh, post-operatively measured uh, values, arterial, mixed venous, oxygen saturation, et cetera. Um, but what the main difference were basically um, twofold. Number one, um, the patient that ended up paraplegic in the first five hours post-operative had a significantly higher mean central venous pressure. It was certainly not um, extremely uh, elevated, but it was, it was a trend and it was significant. Um, what we expected was to find um, a significant different difference in the mean um, arterial pressure, and we were very surprised when we didn't find any difference in the two groups. And then um, we went back and said, okay, these patients had been probably high, some of them had been um, suffering from uh, arterial hypertension, and the collateral network probably adjusted to that. So we looked what these patients' um, pressures were preoperatively, and then we found that that's the most impress impressive, really, um, finding of this study, that those that ended up paraplegic did postoperatively only reach 80% of their mean arterial pressures, as opposed to the, to the um, control group. So, um, in conclusion, delayed onset paraplegia may be associated with a relatively high mean central venous pressure and a low relative um, systemic pressure. So a better hemodynamic and fluid, man fluid management, management um, is probably going to help us to avoid spinal cord injuries. Um, another important point to um, increase flow to the spinal canal and, um, is to decrease the um, pressure within. This is a study by uh, Joe Coselli, um, in which he um, did a randomized trial and showed that overall CSF range resulted in 80% reduction in the relative risk of postoperative deficits. Um, so this is another technique that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but I think uh, Professor Shapens is going to go in detail on this. So in order to optimize spinal cord perfusion pressure, we need to know and control these three par parameters. The central venous pressure, the CSF pressure, and the collateral network pressure. And for that, we need a catheter um, that we've previously, previously introduced about um, two years ago. Um, so this is what we used at Sinai. It's a small 3F pressure catheter that's placed in the stump of a segmental artery. Um, it's basically pretty simple. You just uh, cut the segmental, put that cath in, and then um, you put two elastics 
that going to secure the stump later when you when you're going to pull it um, post-operatively. So what you see in these direct measurements um, was interesting. The uh, collateral network pressure fell during segmental RE sacrifice about by about 15 percent, and it fell dropped again on bypass. So pulsatility seemed to be important, and then it recovered in the post-operative period back to normal, just as we had seen in the animals. Um, five of those patients had post-operative collateral network measurements, and um, here just a couple of uh, slides to show you the data on those. Uh, this is the post-operative um, mean arterial pressure. And you can see here there's these spaghetti plots, the pink one, this is the unfortunate patient that um, ended up paraplegic, and you see that this guy had the same uh, mean aortic uh, or mean arterial pressure throughout the post-operative course. Also, he had the same CSF pressure. Um, he had a little bit elevated um, post-operative CVP. But when we calculated um, the CN pressure, the collateral network pressure, or when we measured it and just looked into what the difference or what the percentage of mean arterial pressure was, we already would see the difference. Unfortunately, at this time, because he was one of the first, we didn't know how to interpret these values because we just didn't have any regular norm values. But then if you uh, use that formula that we derived from the previous experiments, um, that uh, spinal cord perfusion pressure actually is the collateral network pressure minus the CSF pressure, we could see this significant difference between the one that ended up paraplegic and those that had a normal post-operative course. So in conclusion, the collateral network prevents spinal cord perfusion pressure from falling more than 15% even after extensive segmental artery sacrifice at 32 degrees Celsius. Spinal cord perfusion drops, uh, pressure drops significantly with non-pulsatile flow. Recovery is observed with restoration of pulsatile perfusion in all patients without spinal cord injury recovered spinal cord perfusion pressure post-operatively within 24 hours to individual pre-segmental artery sacrifice levels. During the first 24 post-operative um, hours, the corrected spinal cord perfusion pressure was significantly low in the patient with subsequent paraparesis. So um, it seems that direct spinal cord perfusion pressure monitoring is clinically feasible and may help to detect and prevent spinal cord perfusion pressure diminution below levels critical for spinal cord recovery during and after open and endovascular repair of extensive um, descending thoracic and thoracal abdominal aneurysms. Um, so let me use the last three minutes of uh, that talk to what I think is the most important implication of all these ideas. And um, we talked about the classic idea of blood supply to the spinal cord from Professor Adamskiewicz dating back to 1980, 1881. Um, and this is um, a study showing and showing you a series from Mount Sinai. I'm sure Professor Chapins will um, tell you more about evoked potential monitoring in a bit. These are 100 patients in which um, segmental arteries were routinely sacrificed. SAP and MEP monitoring um, was used intraoperatively, and it showed the capacity um, of the collateral network to actually um, recover spinal cord function or maintain it, because um, in this series, only 2% suffered paraplegia. And if you look at this area, the pink area that is the area where the Adamskiewicz was supposed to uh, arise from, we would have expected a much higher um, percentage. So um, I'm sure you all know this man. This is uh, Dr. Grieb. And this is his uh, concept, which I was just talking about. Um, and in the following, I'm going to show you some impressive pictures. This is one that you've seen already. And you can see macroscopically one of the large longitudinal collaterals um, that we found when we uh, injected one segmental uh, with a different color than the rest of the collateral network. And um, I haven't shown you this one yet. And this is what I would actually like you to take home. Um, these pictures illustrate the dynamics between the remodeling of this network. Um, from a dorsal view, you can see the, uh, and appreciate the presence of numerous natural anastomoses along the axis of the body. And you see here, if you take a closer look at the microstructure under the scanning electron microscope, that these anastomoses um, start a realigning process after five days when the segmentals are gone. And this is actually 
um, a little bit more scientifically precise what happens. You can see here that the mean deviation after five days approaches six degrees, so it's almost parallel to the spine. And the arterial, arterial network reorients itself, facilitating, facilitating collateral flow along the cord. So after that, we were obviously wondering, um, does this remodeling occur in a clinical situation? And so we went back again to the, uh, to the database and picked out two groups of patients um, that had a one-stage procedure. And then we compared them to people, the patient that came twice with um, aneurysms that occurred to a couple of years or month and had a two-stage procedure, not intentionally, um, but more or less accidentally. And these patients were, the two groups were basically similar, except for the um, total segmental artery sacrifice, which was significantly different, and it was actually higher in the two-stage group. Um, and here you can see these two groups again, and, and you can appreciate that there was the same or even higher number of segmentals taken in the two-stage group, and out of the one-stage group, eight patients suffered paraplegia, where there were zero cases of paraplegia in the two-stage group. So in conclusion, a staged approach to extensive thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair may dramatically reduce the incidence of spinal cord injury, and this may be of importance in designing new strategies involving hybrid or entirely endovascular procedures. And it's not unreasonable to think that the collateral network pressure could be measured even in TVAR um, in the future, placing a segmental artery cath just prior to stent deployment. And it's also not unreasonable to um, think that one could um, basically provoke the collateral network remodeling by preoperative occlusion of selected segmental arteries, possibly by, uh, by, intra, by coiling, basically. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation and the impressive slides. The paper is open for discussion. In, in your practice now, what's the main adjunct you use during thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair, if it's um, open? Yeah, well, it's basically two different. Um, if we, I, now I'm at Leipzig, so Leipzig is a little bit different from what we did at Sinai, but what we did 